This is a Cult of Personality podcast, episode number 114, featuring an interview with internationally renowned philosopher and mystic Neil Kramer. I'm your host, Greg Kaminsky. Thank you for listening. Support for Occult of Personality podcast comes from the subscribers to the Occult of Personality membership section, as well as those generous listeners from all over the world who clicked the donate button on the occultofpersonality.net website to sponsor this episode. Thanks again to Trina, Chris, Neil, Michal from Slovakia, and especially Steve in the UK. Now, in podcast episode number 114, an interview with mystic, philosopher, and essayist Neil Kramer. You can find Neil online at neilkramer.com, as well as his previous appearance in A Cult of Personality podcast episode number 98. In this recording, Neil questions our perception of normality and consensus reality as he analyzes current events and the future that is being built. Bear in mind that we recorded this interview during the twilight of the summer of 2011, after the England riots in early August. But many of the issues addressed here are even more relevant in light of the economic and political crises in Europe, the Occupy movement in the United States, and the war escalation across the globe. Neil takes a very hard look at the situation from a perspective that is anything but typical. Neil Kramer, I want to welcome you back to A Cult of Personality podcast. It's a pleasure to speak with you once again. Thank you, Greg. It's great to be here. Glad to contribute to your uh, project. It's uh, such a lot of interesting guests and such a wealth of information that... Um, it's, uh, it's good to be part of it. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. And I know the listeners do as well. Let's see, since we last spoke, it seems like the external world, politically, economically, in a lot of very demonstrable ways, has seemingly been turned upside down. <laughs> I don't think I have to go into citing all the events. We can just tick off some of the highlights, a tsunami, an earthquake in Japan, not to mention the consequent uh, nuclear disaster, the unemployment situation in many countries, all of this debt that's been run up by banks and somehow transferred onto the backs of people, and not to mention the uprisings and violence in the Middle East, and it seems like things are escalating. Indeed. In your opinion, as a philosopher, as a mystic, as a visionary, as someone who investigates human consciousness and the human condition in general, what can you tell us about what's been happening and our relation to this preconception of normality that we like to hold on to? Well, I think it begins by taking a look for a moment at what, what normality is um, and what that means to people, um, both the mainstream people, if you like, and um, people who have chosen to walk a different path and be more sovereign and concentrate on their own unfoldment and esoteric studies and so on and so forth. Um, I mean, normality, really, we have to kind of start to just contemplate what that actually is. And I think etymologically, you know, you're seeing it really as a conforming to a standard. That's what it really is. It's, it's a commonality. And it's also interesting to see that the sort of secondary term for that, this is quite fresh in my memory actually because I've been talking about it recently, is that it also serves to found and establish a standard. So norm normality is actually quite an important tool, I think, for any governing body, um, such as, you know, obviously the United States and Europe and many of the Western powers. 
Um, and we see it really as uh, it's quite a humorous thing, really, for the people who move in the circles uh, that you and I and your listeners do, in that normality is, is almost um, invariably something that one tends to push away from and has all, always been a cause for concern, really, to some extent early on in, in one's unfoldment. And it is examining that normality and contemplating what it is that, that sends us to some degree on, on the path that we each walk. And in discussing what normal is, um, I mean, I have this conception that I teach and discuss and explore in, in the workshops that I give of this kind of seven-dimensional uh, universe of these seven densities or spheres or ethers or planes, things I'm sure uh, you and your listeners are very accustomed to. And I just really formulate this into, it's just my personal understanding of how reality seems to hang together. And so you could say that we inhabit a third density space within this model. And um, normality, a lot of people imagine that, well, normal is that three-dimensional space. But I, I consider normality to be this incredibly thin sliver, this very single, uh, narrow broadcast within that third density. And really, when you look at what it is, the most normal things are the things that we see on television, the um, sitcoms, the movies, uh, shopping, gadgets, games, news, business, war, um, corporations, sport, all, all those different crazy things. Um, that is what is normal. So if, if anyone were to say, to come from another world and sit with me for a moment and say, explain what normal is. I'd say, well, just watch television for an hour or two and you'll, you'll get a good idea of what normal is supposed to be and what it is um, propagated as. And you look at this thing and the deeper you look at it, certainly from a philosophical aspect, um, and then one would expect uh, a, a spiritual um, slice to arise out of that, it becomes more and more um, absurd, this normality, the deeper you look at it. And if you really kind of stand at your center and stop referencing endlessly external things and just look at it from your own sort of truth and from your own open, you know, integral vision, it is rather comical, really. It's as comical as it is disastrous in many ways. And um, certainly the more solemn stuff when we are given the news, for example, so-called news, and all the doom and gloom and solemnity with which that's delivered, for me, just adds to the absurdity. Um, and I think you can define it really by saying the strange thing about normal is you have to ask the question of who is making normal, who is fabricating it, who is manufacturing it, who is packaging it. And it is, you know... Um, Obviously, this leads one into slightly conspiratorial waters if, if, if you're not too careful. But you could say um, certainly there are institutes and foundations and think tanks and commissions and so on, uh, many of which we, we probably are aware of. Doubtless, many we're not aware of at all. And so Chatham House, uh, Council on Foreign Relations, Trilateral Commission, the Bilderberg, Tavistock, um, the IMF, uh, all these different organizations and then the secret societies, which I don't need to go over that here. And a lot of those um, bodies manufacture normal, if you really look into it. Certainly in the 60s and 70s, it's quite clear to track that because uh, the media wasn't as fragmented as it is now. And so that transmission of normal, what I sometimes call the unreality broadcast, just with a kind of uh, you know, take that with a pinch of salt, but that unreality broadcast, that measuring stick derives from these organizations. And um, one way to think about it is to say, well, I, I don't contribute to what's normal in this world. If I walk around New York City, the, the images that I see that, that reflect normality are not anything that I would participate in. They're not anything that I have made. And if you extend that out, then not anything that any of my friends or colleagues or family or anybody 
anyone I've ever met has ever contributed to. And certainly the big uh, resonators of normality stem from rather synthetic sources. So it seems to me that when you, when you look at this, um, this thing that I call the construct, which is this um, very synthetic reality tunnel that is put forth as a, as a filter, as a way, of, a lens of looking at the world through, um, normality is a very important aspect of that. And it really, you know, it keeps people on the straight and narrow, um, a government might say, and it, keep, it keeps people from <clears throat> descending into lawlessness or uh, some sort of wild abandon. And of course, when you look at questions of sovereignty and independence, uh, even divinity, then that whole thing begins to um, dissolve somewhat. And so religion is offered up as the bridge between um, what is synthetic and what is organic. So those people are starting to figure out that the constructs view of normality is not fulfilling and is not entirely satisfying and actually is rather dreary and repetitive. And if you're a sensitive person, it's, it can be very soul crushing. Then those people are offered a, a version of spirituality, which again is, is packaged very peculiar fashion as, as a religion, as a, you know, priests basically who have this set of doctrines, whether it's, Christian or Islamic or Judaic or whatever. And, uh, you know, those, those priests are ordained and somebody ordains them and there's this lineage. And, of course, when we trace the roots of these things, we, we see that they kind of, like, pinched a lot of their ideas from elsewhere. Um, and the inner, the inner groups who do the interesting work are completely out of the sort of public domain anyway, so we're only dealing with the sort of exoteric shell of this. So the question of normality, when you probe it, is really a broadcast, and it's a broadcast of, of governance, essentially. And it has some fun aspects, of course, and because of the huge diversity and proliferation of media, we can say that there are some good things that come through normality, this, this broadcast, and some of the music and the arts and the uh, more human aspects of culture certainly are rather interesting and good to look at. But taken on the whole, if you look at some of the most um, concerning aspects of normality, then we could say, well, let's imagine for a moment that um, we, we have these 52 weeks in the year, and for a lot of people, 48 of those weeks are given to um, something that they're not entirely inspired by, and that investment, that energy, is poured into something that is essentially just uh, a mechanism to put food on the table, a roof over your head, and to heat you up or cool you down, and, and so on and so forth. And that there's obviously some <laughs> common sense in that, but the ratio, that 90-odd percent of giving our time away to something that is not an authentic way of behaving in most cases, there are some exceptions, of course, but for the vast majority of Europeans and Britons and Americans, normality really is a grind and it is it is just not something that lifts the human spirit and is not something that inspires people there's no magic to it and certainly the the bits that are fun are really just kind of sideshows just sedatives and distractions and so i think for a lot of people one of the things that is becoming apparent now is that that the promise of normality which is if you work hard you can reap the benefits and you can bring in your harvest a little later on in life in your 50s or 60s or 70s depending on what you do and where you are that vision is beginning to fade for a lot of people now and a lot of people certainly in britain and america as two places i'm quite familiar with now a lot of young people can credibly look into the future and say i don't think i'll ever be able to retire in the same way that my grandfather would have done. I don't think that's actually going to happen now. And so the whole principle of working for one's future benefit is, is being called into question, however informed or uninformed someone is. And I think that's really interesting because it, it starts to expose some of the preposterousness and some of the fractures in this normality. 
and it makes people think, well, this doesn't work. It's, it's broken. This system is, is not functioning properly. And at a very high level, you could say, well, strategically, all such systems have a finite lifetime, and then at the end of it, they have to reboot in some way. And the politically-minded people, the activists, and the, those who have some sort of faith in um, the Constitution or the uh, rules and regulations that govern a free society, people who think in that manner are put in a very challenging position then because they have to say, well, is this brokenness reversible? You know, can we go to Parliament, go to Capitol Hill and actually start to work to make something better and more equitable? And I think if one is really hand on heart, truly looking at that question and answering it, if, you, if you're on the electric chair of truth, where a wrong answer gets you electrocuted and you have to have to give the real answer, the answer is no, that situation is not reversible. And so it makes people concerned because I think there is a, what one might call a genetic memory to say there is some sort of cataclysmic element to this thing. There is um, an apocryphal or um, a catastrophic element that we feel uh, on the horizon somewhat. And just on the heels of that, only in the same way, only in the same way that it would be a cataclysm for a flower at the approach of fall. And it would be somewhat worrying to see the first frosts and snows come for all kinds of plant and animal life. And so it is a seasonal thing. It is cyclical. And I think if one is philosophically and spiritually able just to shift out of concerns for oneself for a moment and shift up that energy ladder and just move out of the preservation instincts and just look at it, just look at it for a moment from a, um, a more sort of balanced and selfless um, perspective, we could say, well, this is probably a good thing. This system is broken. It, it isn't equitably constructed. It isn't structured in such a way that the democracy is true. It's, it's somewhat of a charade, really. And I think even the most um, optimistic and cynical politicians are aware of that. In each in each distinct um, different viewpoint, I think that's that's understood. And the problem is, well, what do we have in absence of such a system? What else is there there? What else do we have? And the the myth that is put forth from certainly the UK government in recent times, with all the um, altercations and riots and um, strife that have been you know, splattered all over the newspapers and television. The UK government is saying, well, you either, you either have our order or you have chaos. You either have this civility that is um, beamed to you from the turrets of government or you have this Mad Max free-for-all looting, raping, pillaging madness. And I think that is a very false dichotomy it's a very thin sliver of a an idea and again when probed it doesn't really hold water it doesn't really stand up to the task so for me it brings one back to a very very fundamental thing which is that much of what we see on the outside is a, a very very literal reflection of what's on the inside and so there's a certain responsibility for the state of the earth and the state of human society and the population and on all its different maladies there's a certain responsibility that we all share in that and any sort of fanciful visions of government and freedom and liberty and um this kind of political equanimity is is nonsense really and i think everybody knows that deep inside and yet with a, a population globally of seven billion with all these broken systems in America and Europe and Britain and all the upheavals in, in the East and so on, and the blossoming of China, which is, is soon set to start to wither already, from what I can gather at the edges, um, we do face the prospect of saying, well, something's got to change here. And most people 
um, are not willing to accept that the change starts from the inside out, not the other way around. And I think that's when you start to have to address questions of philosophy, of mysticism, of spirituality, of phenomena in the world, and start to broaden one's thinking and deepen one's thinking to say, well, we can look at some other factors here. It's not just in the corridors of power. There's some things going on with the sun. If you map solar cycles against um, some of the activities that we've seen in, seen in the last two to three weeks, certainly in Britain, it, there's a very interesting correlation. And if you map planetary alignments, again, nothing new to your audience, but there's a very interesting correlation at the moment. And, of course, all the talk of various um, Mayan calendar calculations and so on and so forth, all those things do have some relationship to what's going on. So the whole hermetic principle first, you know, put forth in the, uh, the Emerald Tablet of uh, the, the micro and the macro being intimately related and indeed being really reflections of each other, not just um, symbolic, but very literal. That wisdom is now finding its way slowly but surely into the mainstream. And I think people are starting to understand that. Um, certainly in my travels over the last few months in particular, I've heard so many people, both um, in the mainstream and conscious and spiritual circles, all those different areas, so many people have said, you know, goodness me, I am going through so much turmoil at the moment, you know, domestically, in business, financially, emotionally. It's just crazy. And then, you know, I look at the newspapers and it's just the same thing. And I think... For the first time in my life, I'm starting to see more and more people start to click that there is a, a very, very significant connection between the two. And it's more magical than certainly the unreality broadcast, the normal broadcast would have us think. It's far more magical than that. And of course, that kind of plays to my perceptions and philosophies and strengths, one would hope, in that more and more people are switching on to um, information, uh, the kind of stuff that you broadcast, the kind of things that I talk about, more and more of a diverse audience is coming to this now and saying, religion in, in the mainstream isn't giving me any answers, so I have to go on this journey myself. And it's a classical journey, which more and more people are slowly beginning to um, arrive at, really through crisis more than anything else. So... That's a long answer, but that's that's what I see. It's quite a landscape to behold. <laughs> One of the things I often think about in this reality reflection, the inner and the outer, the way that that it manifests, uh, the crisis that seems to bring us to revelation of some sort or another. Because it's mm -hmm. always a revelation of some sort or another, whether you think it's a mystical one or just figuring out how the hell you're supposed to deal with mundane, everyday crap. But it forces us to deal with it. It does, yeah. And I think we, we probably, it was perhaps you and I that touched on this last time we spoke, that there is this definite principle at work where if we ignore these small negative impulses and there is this tendency in people to disown um, their spiritual path and to disown their authentic being. Um, and sometimes those words might sound a little, um, a little sanctimonious, but just, just to be an authentic man or woman, let's just put it like that, if we disown that in a kind of chronic manner, um, it seems that the universe won't let us get away with it. And so even in one's personal life, you find that, you know, this single sort of ignored emotional impulse that's negative or a physical impulse or a, a mental abstraction, whatever it is, something that occurs that you think that's weird and I know I should take a look at it, but I don't want to. Um, people go through these three patterns of delaying this work, this inner work, and uh, displacing it with other things, some good, some bad, but displacing it nevertheless and I think what I see is that every time one does that, and we all do it from time to time, but um, 
somebody who is on a conscious path does it a lot less than someone who is operating in normality, shall we say. Um, the more we disown those things and disavow that unfoldment, which is to me is a natural ascendant human thing, then the universe throws these issues back at you and it, it puts them exactly the same as before. Um, at the core of the issue, it's exactly the same, but it will be different scenery, maybe different people, different relationships, different uh, textures and colors and so on. But also notably, each time it returns, it comes back a bit harder and a bit denser and a little bit more difficult to ignore. And so um, for the wise person, once they've been knocked over for like the fifth time on the same issue, whatever that may be for us individually, and sometimes they're very intimate or um, very, very personal things, whatever that issue is, the wise person will look at it and go, you know what, I'm seeing a pattern here. This is the same thing I was trying to deal with two years ago, and it, I didn't really deal with it. I just walked away from it. I left the scene of the crime. So you know what, I'm going to face this thing, and I'm going to face this fear this pain, this suffering inside, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with it. And whatever that is, uh, an anxiety or a depression or um, a fear, whatever it is, a jealousy, it could be anything, uh, that's what the wise move is. But increasingly, and certainly this is part of the unreality broadcast, the normal world says, hey, that's life. Life sucks, basically. So what you do is just fill it with fun things and distractions and so whether that for somebody is just sitting, eating a lot of pizza and drinking beer and watching um, old science fiction shows, and then for someone else it might be being uh, a busy, grown-up business person in Manhattan working 15 hours a day every day. Those two things are equally um, displacement activities, equally disavowals of one's authentic path. And you can't get away with it. It certainly looks like you can sometimes when you see people who are apparently having a good time and not necessarily deserving it. But actually, again, probe a little bit deeper and you cannot get away with it. And so if you pan that out at the planetary level, we cannot get away with just ignoring the things that we all know we should be doing. And we can't get away with not having the courage and the strength and the liberated mentality to do something about our own life and to take control of it and design it and own it to take responsibility for it and just going to do the normal things go to school and university and work hard and pay the bills and hope for the best you know that seems like a a, a quite amicable and responsible grown-up thing to do but actually it isn't it's actually a a cop-out it's an excuse. And I think when we look at what's happening in the world, these are the results of that. And for me, we're all responsible for that, everybody. Uh, some, of course, more than others. But that intimate, intimate unfoldment of consciousness is directly related to the riots on the streets of London and Birmingham and Manchester and Bristol and so on in, in England. Those those two things are very, very uh, personal and very closely mapped, polarized perhaps, but very closely mapped reflections of each other. And I think that a normal society that discredits spiritual unfoldment and the ascendant human journey is always subject to that self-destructive um, impulse. And that's what it is. It's self-destruction in the same way that the unhappy um, wife who can't sit down with the husband and say, this isn't working, I don't want to be with you anymore. In the same way that the, the wife who can't do that will have an affair to bring about the destruction. Um, so it is with society that people will literally trash the place. And my belief is there's more pleasure and more catharsis and power in a way, although it's a negative shadow reflection, in smashing than there is in looting. So if you actually look at those uh, clips, not that they're particularly pleasant to, to observe, but I don't think it's really about stealing running shoes and televisions and iPads and stuff. I think it's more about rage 
and it's more about an inner aggression that has very, very few articulations in a modern society. And that is, of course, a pressure cooker that, given the slightest excuse, will just blow. And so this this um, this kindling, you know, just a little tiny spark, and the whole thing goes up. And it is it is a, a little known fact that there are uh, a lot of riots uh, in England, not necessarily of this scale, but certainly in the north, there are many cities in uh, what used to be Lancashire and uh, Yorkshire where a lot of racial tensions, ethnic um, uh, divisions, uh, poverty tensions will come out, and they usually come out in July and August. And that I've seen that year after year after year. And sometimes, as I say, they're relatively small in scale, and sometimes they're a lot larger. But historically, again, if you pull out and look at that, that pressure valve is almost like a controlled thing uh, that it, it's allowed to do that every now and again. The difference this time is that the extreme inadequacy of the British Prime Minister David Cameron's explanation of these things as criminality, which is basically the explanation he offered, criminality pure and simple, that is absolutely inadequate, absolutely nonsense thing to to put forth. It's it's shameful. And they're not even making the effort to explain it, basically. It's not necessarily about money. It's not necessarily just about education. It's something very deep in the English hierarchical social structures. And it, it is essentially a caste system. And the lower castes really have no social mobility no economic prospects whatsoever. You can't just go to college and learn to be a plumber or a carpenter or a brain surgeon and then pull yourself out. That Those options are not available for millions of uh, Britons. They're just not there. So would you say, in your in your opinion, would you agree with the analysis that says uh, the lower classes just watch the upper classes loot society wholesale with no consequences and then in reaction they do the same yeah i've seen that yes uh, it's hard to say no to that let's put it that way i've seen that meme um bubble up from the alternative media and it started to surface in the mainstream media this idea as you say that the uh, upper echelons of human society this ex- extreme minority have been raping and pillaging on on a grand scale for a long time, very deeply, in a very uh, disgusting manner. And people see that, and people have had to kind of swallow that for a long time, and particularly in Britain, where there has been this um, centuries and centuries of um, repression, not necessarily in the old-fashioned medieval monarchy sense, but a lot of people in Europe are being... Uh, have become accustomed to being told what to do. Now, of course, I'm happy to say that particularly in Britain, uh, as some somewhere that I know very well, most people fundamentally are not going to put up with that indefinitely. They're going to they're going to snap and they're going to do something about it. Um, but to suggest that that is just being um, exhibited through external violence in what some would call the underclass it is a misnomer really it's that's that's not a valid um viewpoint it's it's expressed in all strata of society <clears throat> and certainly the middle classes i would say are some of the most disenfranchised and disillusioned people you could come across in britain at the moment because they have been ransacked basically and people who have been working pretty hard for the last 30 40 years are now looking at a situation where they cannot really stop working still, and now they're in the 60s, and they, they kind of can't stop. And the promise was a hollow promise. And so I don't know what's worse, having nothing and, and you know, being in a position where there's a very limited thing amount to lose, or having uh, invested in this system and being given these promises and these guarantees, and then the rug has just been pulled from under the feet so that disenfranchisement runs throughout society um and it's not just britain it's i speak to people in um sweden and the netherlands and 
Iceland um, relatively frequently, certainly several times a month. And, you know, I'm hearing the same stories there. And the, the inadequacies of the economic system to support its population is also just laughable as well in that the, the price of gasoline in in England is just is just crazy. You know, some people are having to stop using a car because they can't afford it. So, they, you know, many middle-class families now are having to think before they hop in the car and go anywhere if that's actually doable right now. And certainly what uh, we would call working-class families are definitely having to do that. And they're definitely having to think about what's going in the sort of shopping cart every week, whereas it wasn't always as bad as that, but now it's it's really ridiculous. So fundamentally, I think that that observation that the system is unfair and is um, is like a sort of roulette wheel that's rigged has has been understood at every class and at every level and at every conscious level and every vibration through the system. And the people who are going to snap first are the people with the least to lose. But when the middle classes snap, then you've got a serious problem because they're the ones who basically float the economy with this illusion uh, by investing in it emotionally rather than anything else, in my view. And that is more fundamental. That's starting to change because there comes a point, I think, where people realize that violence is a pretty short-term pressure valve even for oneself or for a society or a government. It's not really a a long-term strategy. But when you stop purchasing and when you stop consuming and when you stop believing, then there's a fundamental problem. So any sort of shadow rulers who are tinkering with this game board at the moment are fully aware of this and they they have a very significant quandary which is that that situation really isn't reversible now because politicians have just become um, wholly um, discredited and politics in the UK is just a a sort of grotesque puppet show now. Um, Some would say it always has been, but it's so transparent now that, as I say, even those, um, you know, who are more accustomed to sort of dinner parties and... um, you know, charity drives rather than bottles of whiskey on the street corner. Whoever they are, whatever circles they move in, everybody is saying the system doesn't work and it's not here for the benefit of the people and it isn't free. And so that presents that very inescapable observation that, well, why is it like that? Who built it? Who who designed it in that manner? And are there any precedents for this? Is there a, is there a, an alternative path And when it becomes obvious that it's been like that for a long time, probably about three or 4,000 years, then there's a a very immediate and very hard dissonance, cognitive dissonance that sets in, which is just this wave of unsettling, weird belief that everything that they thought they knew is wrong. That then divides people into two categories, those who do something about that and go on a journey an inner journey and an outer journey and those who just think this is too weird i'm just gonna cross my fingers hope for the best maybe get a little a few more cans of beans in in the uh in the cupboard and let's just hope it all blows over and goes back to normal and those divisions are widening at the moment and um of course it's really all about this disavowal of one's journey and so the only path is to understand that you have to decrease your reliance on that system physically emotionally mentally everything and you have to start to understand that the independence and the power and the decision making doesn't come from anywhere else except from inside us and we have to stop um having this kind of um you know uh what's that syndrome where the the high the high the um What's it called? Stockholm Syndrome, is it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you know that one? Right, that's where the hostages begin to identify with their captors. (laughs) That's right, yeah. And I think uh, many people in society have that kind of uh, mentality, uh, the way that the rich and powerful uh, royals, etc., are held in such awe, 
the whole idea of celebrity status, wealth, um, and I could agree with you in the sense that obviously the system is corrupt, uh, the foundations are cracking, uh, it's better to see it go down than to try to save something that's totally not able to be saved. On the other hand, there is this nagging voice that's intimating this thought that the creators of civilization are great, their ideas are the reason we have so many good aspects to civilization, and the price of letting it collapse to the degree that it looks like it could, there's going to need, need to be some sort of massive, I don't want to say die-off, but it, it looks pretty scary in some sense. And I know that's, you know, the fear versus this going through the fire process, but is it really worth taking that journey consciously when it may mean a serious tragedy on a large scale? Well, again, this, this makes us uh, think about how we perceive uh, the structure of reality. If we say, well, there's the 3D, and that's it. And for a lot of people, that is people's conception of how the real world fits together. There's this three-dimensional di- three world, very well described by mainstream science, and that's it. If, that's, if that is one's reality, then that 3D world is going to be severely rattled over the coming months and years. There's no doubt about it. And at a, another level, you could say, well, it seems to be that there is a natural seasonal shift from energy, kind of like with air pressure and how that creates wind as, as the air moves from you know low to high and so on and so forth. There is this natural momentum where energy moves from this a lower dimensional state to a higher dimensional state. And so there's kind of some sort of phase shift. And the way I see it, and this is this is my answer to that and uh, my observations about what you say because it's a, an important point. The way I see it is that there's there's a kind of phasing from a purely three dimensional aspect to a a fourth dimensional aspect, and I don't necessarily mean some complete new world and a, a totally new realm like some Tolkien esque realm or something or some space alien realm. Not necessarily like that at all. Just I mean, in terms of a frequency shift that the whole solar system as a, in my view, as a conscious entity shifts up a gear, basically every so often, every six or 12 or 25,000 years, there are these incremental points where the whole thing moves and it moves in such a way that everything physically has to shift. And that favors those who have been working on that shift within themselves and shifts those who haven't into quite a different realm and one of the markers for that movement is very extreme polarity so where the good things are really good as you say there are some astonishingly good things about society and about the way we live our lives and about the technology the very technology we're using now with our computers and microphones and all that stuff, there are some wonderful things. And if it wasn't for the internet, a lot of consciousness would still be at a very low level. So it's only really from like 1996 that there's been this huge boost through some of the things that we enjoy. Um, But this polarity works both ways. So the good things get good and the bad things get even worse. And there seems to be a point where it's at such crazy levels. It's so diverse and so weird and weird in the the ancient sense of the word as like unreal as magical almost that you think well this can't go on i've no idea how on earth this is going to be restructured because that would seem to be a thousand years work that i don't think anybody's quite got the stomach or brains for quite frankly and so what on earth are we going to do and i think that the the sort of uh higher level the galactic level really is is saying don't worry about that 
because there are two elements to this. There are some unreal meltdowns, as I call them, with the economy is a very, um, a very peculiar um, entity when you look at it and the Federal Reserve and what that is and this fractional reserve banking system. It's very, very odd indeed. Um, and to suggest that the powers that be or the powers that were, as they're now becoming, um, didn't understand that when they designed it, I think would be very naive. I think it's very well understood that the economic systems have a finite life and then have to be rebooted, just like in the same way that um, you know a German economy would be trashed after various reparations and so on after a, a world war brought to a certain point and then rise again as the most powerful um, economic system in Europe. I think that's planned decades in advance, I've no doubt about it through my studies at all, and of course that's rather an esoteric view these days um, in the mainstream, but I don't think it will be. I think when you trace it, I think that becomes rather obvious. But aside from these unreal meltdowns, there's also this, as I say, unplanned brokenness in that people just don't want to do it anymore. People don't want to give 90% of the time away to something that's rubbish, essentially. They don't want to do that. And I think, I think it's been a tremendous surprise to the system that people um, have come out in such numbers and said, I don't want to do that anymore. I'm not interested in money in the way that I thought I should have been. And I have observed the, the system, the control system, as I call it sometimes, deploy these very bizarre countermeasures to compensate for their failings. And I am happy now, uh, to use that word, that the control system is beginning to uh, rupture. It's beginning to fail. And I think that if you take a sort of magnifying glass and go over the news and look at all the different things that occur with um, WikiLeaks and hackers and all these fiscal problems and um, all the uprisings and upheavals and revolutions, uh, you could say that there's some conspiracy there. You could say that there's some um, naughtiness there, definitely. But there's also um, some natural elements to some of that, which I think has been a tremendous surprise. And I think it is stretching the um, capacity of the control system to actually do something about it. So I do think that they, in parenthesis, are, are struggling at the moment because so many people are sort of beginning to um, detonate their old beliefs and their old traditions. And I even see this in my own friends and family, you know, people who I thought were absolutely dyed in the wool, um, Democrats, Republicans, Laborites, Conservatives, whatever, who had these very strong views that they've carried around for um, half a century, some of them. They're beginning to think, you know what, it's all, that's all nonsense, isn't it? That is all nonsense. And um, it doesn't quite work like that. And their views on um, society and on multi multiculturalism as a myth, basically, um, not in any sense of um, racial prejudice whatsoever, but the idea that um, it's something that everybody, uh, all communities and societies need, some of those, some extremely um, biased and imprudent planning in Britain, certainly in some some of the areas in London on that front, has created tremendous problems for people of all ethnic backgrounds. And you can trace that back to some very strange policies in the 50s and 60s that don't benefit anybody, black, white, red, green, yellow, doesn't matter what colour. And it seems to be that that um, built-in obsolescence was there from the very beginning, just like if you buy a, an iPod, the, the machine is designed to be a useless doorstop in a, in a few years because otherwise if they built a pristine, brilliant, functioning, replaceable, self-maintaining device, you know, obviously it would be difficult to sell new ones. So the system has built-in obsolescence. The difference is that it's only a very small faction within that control system who have the, the higher perspective to say, well, actually, we're not just talking about the 3D here. There are moves that nobody is in control of. There are phase shifts at a very high energetic level that nobody is in control of, that it appears that the sun 
and the Earth and the Moon in particular, those three um, astral bodies, go through these cycles. And the only people who understood that are not around anymore. So there was there is obviously some wisdom uh, regarding this from the ancient world, i.e., the undocumented uh, world that is just shrouded in mists now. But as you know full well, some of that information was protected and guarded, and some of it is still in good hands, and some of it got into the wrong hands. But there is a body of wisdom out there, a body of sacred texts and science and art and mysticism and sorcery of a good nature that says, listen, folks, this stuff goes on all the time. And these seasonal energetic shifts represent massive changes and um, very, very um, radical bifurcation points where the species can literally split off in two. And how apparent that will be is yet to be seen, whether it's a physical split or it's a more subtle split. Um, some of the people I speak to, uh, you know, are very much one or the other. I think it'll probably be a little of both. But I think there is a split on the way, and I don't have any problem with notions of mass die-offs and stuff. And I think that's a completely natural state of affairs in the same way that a forest part of the ecology of the forest that it has a massive burn down every so often otherwise the whole forest would die so the forest itself has to burn down um over extended periods of time certainly within one's lifetime that might sound a bit odd but um an ecologist friend of mine who works in the amazon was i was talking about this and um there's some very interesting parallels with consciousness and energy and um, the ecology of forest life as a whole and fire is part of the successful survival of a large forest environment and in the same way i think that we could say very much the same thing about the earth as a whole and i think naturally on this show at a more esoteric level we find the answers and some of that is most certainly connected to the sun and i think that if anybody wants to go to the root of a lot of these issues because we're just talking about symptoms here we're just talking about the the outer sort of tendrils of this thing but if you want to go to the heart of it the juice of it we need to look at the sun because i think that's where a lot of the answers lie and certainly it starts to explain this um preponderance over um pouring all this energy and time and effort into so-called sun worship which again is a bit of a um odd sort of nomenclature nowadays but when you go to what that actually means as, as a study of the sun and as a, a relationship with that entity and say you know what i don't think it is just a big fireball thing in the sky that heats things up i think there's something more interesting going on and that is where a lot of my work has led um, not in some vast, amazing conclusion, just naturally gravitated to there. So when I see fractures in the societal system and I see um, concerned citizens, you know, most of them really good, by the way, uh, I always find that personally for me, a lot of the assurance and a lot of the um, wisdom comes from this solar body that we're also familiar with in one sense and yet I have no idea of what it actually is and what its relationship is with the earth and I think that is where a lot of the answers lie as to what is going to occur and why it occurs and how frequently this goes on and you have to lift yourself up from being uh, Greg and being Neil because if we do it from that perspective it's, it's not really an operational fair thing to do um, but if you if you lift yourself out of that to this higher self, to this um, fourth dimensional consciousness, if you like, then you can see it and think, well, this is an absolutely organic, normal movement of energy in the system. It's another form of vibration. It's another waveform. It's another manifestation. The fact that things come and go, sometimes on a big scale, is all right. It's completely normal. But you can only do that, of course, from a certain perspective and the normal signal that's broadcast through the newspapers and television and internet doesn't allow that to happen 
because if it did, people would stop worrying and that creates a problem when you're trying to build and maintain a, a political uh, architecture. Just as a speculation, how much do you think this perspective that you have is in alignment with what you might call global elite or the those who are at the higher levels of the control system? If you put yourself in the position of the global elite, do you think mm -hmm. you'd be operating from that same perspective, imposing chaos or pulling the rug out from under the economic system or implementing repressive control system in various ways, all of that sort of thing. If I was in shadow all the time and my consciousness was at that low vibratory rate, I think what we're looking at here is um, in, in my dimensional model, um, you can't really proceed out of a fourth dimensional space um, when you're operating at a very service to self, low vibration, negative aspect, you can't go anywhere. And so I see that there are some um, fourth dimensional entities, intelligences, and you can make of that what you will, that are basically in a very sticky position where a certain consciousness that serves as a source of energy uh, needs to be maintained in a certain low vibratory state. And so if that's the case, then we're not just talking about human beings trying to do the best they can and a few people being a bit, um, you know, um, naughty in order to hoard their resources and wealth to one side. We're not talking about that. We're talking about something a little bit more um, boundary softening a little bit more esoteric which again I, I think a lot of people don't have a massive problem with this it's a way of thinking about it which is that there are these entities that need low vibration consciousness to um, manifest and to maintain their position um, again if you take a look at um, some of the old texts certainly the Gnostic materials they will map this out in quite a nice complete cosmology and say yes there are these entities that came down kind of made a flawed creation and now they're as stuck here as anyone else and one of the things that um, maintains them uh, because of the error in their manifestation is this very low vibration consciousness and if you want to map it to the Hindu formulation of energy pools in the body, you could say that those lower three points of the root, the sacral, and the solar plexus is where most people are at most of the time. So the whole of one's life is centered around preservation and gratification and sensuality. And that's like, you know, a very narrow part of the human experience, and yet it constitutes, however intelligent or thick somebody may be, most of most people's lives and so there's a distinct cutoff of moving consciousness through those higher portals of expression through more independent uh, empowering sovereign centers of expressing consciousness and the normal unreality signal is specifically designed to keep people in those lower three vibratory states and I'm just hanging that on someone else's system that everybody might be familiar with chakras, but that's just one way to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that what is different here, the unplanned element of this brokenness, is that you can't do that indefinitely, and a lot of people are beginning to say, hang on a second, preservation, gratification, and sensuality aren't really enough. I am not fulfilled. I am going to move my consciousness at a higher vibratory rate and what's happening with the sun and the solar system and as the milky way moves along that spiral arm further we are being given the opportunity to have a massive boost to that process to raise that uh, vibratory level and it sounds a bit new agey when you talk about vibrations but just in the same way that um you know, electromagnetic radiation frequencies at a low frequencies would be like AM and FM, and then you move to infrared and ultraviolet and so on. Just in that same manner, I would definitely say that 
you could say that fear and depression and anxiety are low vibrations of consciousness and creativity and joy and love and um, constructive kind of intellectual insight are uh, relatively high vibrations and certainly um, the feminine in society is a very important roadmap for how that works in a very good way which of course is why the church um, virtually eliminated all mystical experiences from womanhood from the 15th century onwards basically um, so the path out of this is not um, impossible um, for the individual and indeed it's a very necessary one and it does involve lots of esoteric um, perspectives of looking at uh, the solar system uh, the sun of the divine feminine in men and in women um, of looking at systems of repression but also at looking at some of the other things as well that become unveiled so we talk about some of the things that um, are possible in society nowadays and one for me which is excellent is that in the last um, year I've never had so many high level conscious conversation with so many people that's never happened before and I don't think that is just because well that's what I do because a lot of the people who I've been speaking to they don't know that this is kind of what I do some of them don't know me from Adam so to speak they don't know anybody uh, related to me I'm just this guy Neil and we were just talking and the, the quality and the, the depth and the clarity of conversation and the honesty more than anything the honesty of people's conversation to me this collapse goes hand in hand with a tremendous openness and a tremendous flow that I've not seen before so some of the dreariness of the 1990s in Britain in particular has started to um, shift in terms of how that um, correlates with conversation and some of those repetitive patterns that people have been putting themselves through for decades are starting to be like imploded from the from you know their own efforts really and that's just a marvelous thing to observe so a lot of people are throwing themselves into uncertainty throwing themselves into the unknown in a, a totally intuitive way and it's usually working out rather well and i think that that is the other part of this polarization to say yeah there is there is a collapse going on but there's also an incredible emanation of consciousness that is like going through the population and um, it's, it's never going to be a mass awakening I don't think it works like that but certain key nodal points certain critical mass I think that's usually how it seems to work certainly from studi studying um, some of the ancient materials and the old texts that's how it's meant to work you don't need billions of people doing this you just need a certain number a few million whatever it is and that is happening and it wasn't happening 20 years ago yeah it's certainly amazing to behold and participate in yeah it is it's fascinating it really is and i appreciate very much your perspective in analyzing and talking about this movement of consciousness and all of the events that are shaping it right now and uh, I think this is a good point to start to wrap it up for this section of our conversation I just wanted to give you an opportunity again to speak to the listeners about you know, where they can find you online and if you have any interesting things you'd like to talk about that are coming up for you sure yeah thank you um, it's very easy to to get my stuff online you just need to go to neilkramer.com um, so that is my website and since last we spoke basically all the different blogs and materials and channels and YouTube things or whatever have all been consolidated in that one place so neilkramer.com is really the place where you can access my interviews essays uh, videos and so on uh, there's also like some uh, things you can buy on there like there's an audio book and there's some other books that I appear in uh, my forthcoming book will be up there um, in the spring I think uh, I also do um, teaching and consultation work as well which is up there and there are various workshops and events that I take part in so if anybody's interested in some of the subjects that I talk about would like to know more and get into it in a 
uh, a deeper, more personal manner than I do um, teach and give workshops on these subjects kind of throughout the year, really. So if you check out the events section on the website, you can find out more about that. Excellent. Thank you again, Neil. I really appreciate it and look forward to speaking with you again soon. You're welcome. I enjoyed it. Thank you. In the Occult of Personality membership section, Neil Kramer discusses the ways that cultivating inner awakenings and mystical experience must be applied practically. Join us for that compelling conversation. or family or anybody anyone I've ever met has ever contributed to and certainly the big uh, resonators of normality stem from rather synthetic sources so it seems to me that when you when you look at this um, this thing that I call the construct which is this um, very synthetic reality tunnel that is put forth as a, as a filter as a way of a lens of looking at the world through um, normality is a very important aspect of that and it really you know it keeps people on the straight and narrow um a government might say and it keep it keeps people from <clears throat> descending into lawlessness or uh, some sort of wild abandon and of course when you look at questions of sovereignty and independence uh even divinity then that whole thing begins to um dissolve somewhat and so religion is offered up as the bridge between um, what is synthetic and what is organic. So those people are starting to figure out that the constructs view of normality is not fulfilling and is not entirely satisfying and actually is rather dreary and repetitive. And if you're a sensitive person, it's, it can be very soul crushing. Then those people are offered uh, a version of spirituality which again is is packaged very peculiar fashion as as a religion as a you know priests basically who have this set of doctrines whether it's christian or islamic or judaic or whatever and uh, you know those those priests are ordained and somebody ordains them and there's this lineage and of course when we trace the roots of these things we we see that they kind of like pinched a lot of their ideas from elsewhere um and the inner the inner groups who do the interesting work are completely out of the sort of public domain anyway. So we're only dealing with the sort of exoteric shell of this. So the question of normality, when you probe it, is really a broadcast, and it's a broadcast of, of governance, essentially. And it has some fun aspects, of course, and because of the huge diversity and proliferation of media, we can say that there are some good things that come through normality this this broadcast slice to arise out of that it becomes more and more um absurd this normality the deeper you look at it and if you really kind of stand at your center and stop referencing endlessly external things and just look at it from your own sort of truth and from your own open you know integral vision it is rather comical really it's as comical as it is disastrous in many ways and um, certainly the more solemn stuff when we are given the news, for example, so-called news, and all the doom and gloom and solemnity with which that's delivered, for me, just adds to the absurdity. Um, and I think you can define it really by saying the strange thing about normal is you have to ask the question of who is making normal, who is fabricating it, who is manufacturing it, who is packaging it and it is you know um obviously this leads one into slightly conspiratorial waters if 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 you're not too careful but you could say um certainly there are institutes and foundations and think tanks and commissions and so on uh, many of which we we probably are aware of doubtless many we're not aware of at all and so Chatham House, uh, Council on Foreign Relations, Trilateral Commission, the Bilderberg, Tavistock, um, the IMF, uh, all these different organizations, and then the secret societies, which I don't need to go over that here. And a lot of those um, bodies 
manufacture normal if you really look into it. Certainly in the 60s and 70s, it's quite clear to track that because uh, the media wasn't as fragmented as it is now. And so that transmission of normal, what I sometimes call the unreality broadcast, just with a kind of, uh, you know, take that with a pinch of salt, but that unreality broadcast, that measuring stick, derives from these organizations. And um, one way to think about it is to say, well, I, I don't contribute to what's normal in this world. If I walk around New York City, the, the images that I see that, that reflect normality are not anything that I would participate in. They're not anything that I have made. And if you extend that out, they're not anything that any of my friends or colleagues in the United States and Europe and many of the Western powers. Um, and we see it really as uh, it's quite a humorous thing, really, for the people who move in the circles uh, that you and I and your listeners do, in that normality is... is almost um, invariably something that one tends to push away from and has all, always been a cause for concern, really, to some extent early on in, in one's unfoldment. And it is examining that normality and contemplating what it is that, that sends us to some degree on, on the path that we each walk. And in discussing what normal is, um, I mean, I have this conception that I teach and discuss and explore in, in the workshops that I give of this kind of seven dimensional uh, universe of these seven densities or spheres or ethers or planes things I'm sure uh, you and your listeners are very accustomed to and I just really formulate this into it's just my personal understanding of how reality seems to hang together and so you could say that we inhabit a third density space within this model and um, normality a lot of people imagine that well normal is that three-dimensional space but I I consider normality to be this incredibly thin sliver this very single uh, narrow broadcast within that third density and really when you look at what it is the most normal things are the things that we see on television the um, sitcoms, the movies, uh, shopping, gadgets, games, news, business, war, um, corporations, sport, all, all those different crazy things. Um, that is what is normal. So if, if anyone were to say, to come from another world and sit with me for a moment and say, explain what normal is, I'd say, well, just watch television for an hour or two and You'll, you'll get a good idea of what normal is supposed to be and what it is um, propagated as. And you look at this thing, and the deeper you look at it, certainly from a philosophical aspect, um, and then one would expect uh, a, a spiritual... Um, This is a Cult of Personality podcast, episode number 114, featuring an interview with internationally renowned philosopher and mystic Neil Kramer. I'm your host, Greg Kaminsky. Thank you for listening. Support for a Cult of Personality podcast comes from the subscribers to the Occult of Personality membership section, as well as those generous listeners from all over the world who clicked the donate button on the occultofpersonality.net website to sponsor this episode. Thanks again to Trina, Chris, Neil, Michal from Slovakia, and especially Steve in the UK. Now, in podcast episode number 114, an interview with mystic, philosopher, and essayist Neil Kramer. You can find Neil online at neilkramer.com, as well as his previous appearance in A Cult of Personality podcast episode number 98. In this recording, Neil questions our perception of normality and consensus reality as he analyzes current events and the future that is being built. Bear in mind that we recorded this interview during the twilight of the summer of 2011, after the England riots in early August. 
But many of the issues addressed here are even more relevant in light of the economic and political crises in Europe, the Occupy movement in the United States, and the war escalation across the globe. Neil takes a very hard look at the situation from a perspective that is anything but typical. Neil Kramer, I want to welcome you back to Occult of Personality podcast. It's a pleasure to speak with you once again. Thank you, Greg. It's great to be here. Glad to contribute to your uh, project. It's uh, such a lot of interesting guests and such a wealth of information that um, it's, uh, it's good to be part of it. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. And I know the listeners do as well. Let's see, since we last spoke, it seems like the external world, politically, economically, in a lot of very demonstrable ways, has seemingly been turned upside down. <laughs> I don't think I have to go into citing all the events. We can just tick off some of the highlights, a tsunami, an earthquake in Japan, not to mention the consequent uh, nuclear disaster, the unemployment situation in many countries, all of this debt that's been run up by banks and somehow transferred onto the backs of people, and not to mention the uprisings and violence in the Middle East. And it seems like things are escalating. Indeed. In your opinion, as a philosopher, as a mystic, as a visionary, as someone who investigates human consciousness and the human condition in general, what can you tell us about what's been happening and our relation to this preconception of normality that we like to hold on to? Well, I think it begins by taking a look for a moment at what what normality is um, and what that means to people, um, both the mainstream people, if you like, and um, people who have chosen to walk a different path and be more sovereign and concentrate on their own unfoldment and esoteric studies and so on and so forth. Um, I mean, normality really we have to kind of start to just contemplate what that actually is and i think etymologically you know you're seeing it really as a conforming to a standard that's what it really is it's, it's a commonality and it's also interesting to see that the sort of secondary term for that this is quite fresh in my memory actually because i've been talking about it recently is that it also serves to found and establish a standard so norm normality is actually quite an important tool, I think, for any governing body, um, such as, you know, obviously the 